also reveals something interesting. There we find the heading with hyphens in the words, the American Zinzori Therapy. Okay. So evidently they are quasi synonymous, right? So the question is, how can they be synonymous? That's the big question. Okay. It is to say, the idea is not new to the German speaking world, at least. The point can be made very simply by citing the title of one of Carl Jung's most influential essays before he got into archetypes and things like that, um, which was titled Die Beziehung der Psychotherapie zu Seelsorge, published 1932 in Zurich, of course. Okay. So, needless to say, Sigmund Freud was not very happy with that paper, uh, but you know, they stopped being friends very early on. But the point is that there is, in fact, the use of the word Seelsorge by you already tells you that he's recognizing the function of the police, or do you want to be really North American, of the shaman, <laughs> and the psychotherapist, okay? So, actually, this tells us that the idea of healing and spirituality is, in fact, something that is not totally new. Of course, spirituality is a new word. It is a relatively modern word, by the way, and it's a word that we use in ways that as a historian, I find problematic, but again, as a therapist or as a student of religion, I find problematic. As a historian, I find problematic because it is a way of avoiding the historical roots of religious traditions. If I say spirituality, then I don't have to bother about the details of a religion. I don't have to bother about an institution, right? And I'm old enough to feel that that's problematic. <laughs> Because for me, religion without society and without social obligation is not quite religion. And I, for me, the spirituality thing feels narcissistic. Feels too much like for me, for me, for me. So that's why I have problems with it. That doesn't mean that I don't have problems with religious institutions, I do. <laughs> that makes me a modern human being. But anyway, the psychotherapists, when they use the idea of meditation, are often speaking that kind of language of this vague spirituality. They are not really trying to solve the problem of how those two universes can communicate. So, for instance, we read in a book with several papers, <laughs> Marsha Leiter, who I mentioned before, with great admiration, but when she says the following, I don't admire her that much. She says, the roots of mindfulness practice, and of course, she's referring to mindfulness practice and psychotherapy, right? The roots of mindfulness practice are in the contemplative practices common to both Eastern and Western spiritual disciplines. How do you like that for historical accuracy? Yeah? Um, there's a uh, I think it was about Radha Krishna. I can't remember who maybe someone in the audience knows who said this about Radha Krishna. And so he made out Radha Krishna. But Radha Krishna was one of those people who idealized Indian philosophy and very often forgot history and said things that have nothing to do with history. And somebody called him an eraser of inscriptions, right? Anytime there was an inscription and told you something about the dates or the location of an event, he would erase it and then go on to some kind of day he sang so over there. So common to both Eastern and Western spiritual disciplines and the emergent scientific knowledge about the benefits of allowing experiences rather than suppressing or avoiding them. Now, you see, I think she's right because it works, the therapy works. Therefore, there is, as she says, an emergent scientific knowledge about the benefits of allowing experiences rather than suppressing or avoiding them. That's true. But is that traditional spirituality? I don't think so. I think most traditional spiritualities have a lot to do with avoiding certain experiences. That's why they are, they fit with an ascetic or moral context. And then she goes on to say, or she or the scholar, so I don't know if I'm very they say both Eastern and Western, I know that I'm sure. Your institute, when you hear Eastern and Western, you get nervous like I do. But 
both Eastern and Western psychologies, psychology, having just said something about scientific psychology, then the effect of the discourse is that you begin to confuse scientific psychology, mindfulness, Western mysticism, etc. And it all seems to be saying the same thing, right? Which of course would be great if it were true. I don't know, it's like the difference of numbers. It feels great. As well as spiritual practices are converging on the same insights. Notice how that also assumes that the Eastern traditions, whatever it means, are in fact somehow moving like a science moves. And that's also problematic. Whether a religion can move in the same way that science moves. And I say problematic because personally, I would like it to be that way, but I don't think. So we have discovered that they are not converging at all, that's my argument, and they are not precisely converging because the statement just quoted is historically inaccurate. The same authors go, go on to make other statements that are not only inaccurate from the point of view of history and the documents of the religions that they seem to appeal to, but are also claims that, in my view, do not add anything of value to the psychological theories, which is my other argument. Right? Whether the Buddha practiced dialectical behavioral cognitive therapy to relieve borderline personality disorder or not doesn't mean anything, right? In fact, I would challenge anyone to demonstrate that he did. Even if he did, how would he demonstrate it? But it doesn't add anything to something that is supposed to be scientific. So that you see, why? Why does it appeal to authority? Then they say, as a set of skills, mindfulness practice is the intentional process of observing, describing, and participating in reality, non judgmentally, in the moment, and with effectiveness. That is to say, using skillful means, which is the adaptation of the body. By the way, I repeat. It's a very, very ingenious, very smart adaptation, but it is an adaptation. We don't have time to know the full details about it. But notice this participating in reality, not judgmentally. Now, anybody who has lived in North America for a year or so knows that there is nothing more North American than don't be judgmental, right? It's the essence of the modern American spirit. And I think it's good. I don't think you should be judgmental. But please don't attribute that to the poor guy. Okay. <laughs> then, in formulating these skills, this therapy drew primarily, and this is revealing, given that she's talking about mindfulness, drew primarily from the practice of Zen. Which is what she what she received this, and she probably received it from an American teacher who had adapted to the American context. And again, I repeat, I have no problem with those adaptations. I think they're great. But don't attribute to them the historical antiquity that they don't have. And, as they add, this, these skills are compatible with Western contemplative and Eastern meditation practices. So, my therapy is the same as Zen, which is actually compatible with all Western and all meditation practices. I don't want the labor point. It's evident. Everything where the problem is, and it is also evident why Buddhist meditation is so nervous, right? That someone is trying to take away from them the authority and the knowledge that they have. Okay. okay. So what I'm saying is that these are overreaching claims of the therapist, and that they begin to approach the kind of hyperbolic language that some religious traditions use, and that tend to bother us today when they do what they do, and that their claims become, in that sense, attempts at resting authority from tradition. And I repeat, I don't see the point, but and why take that authority? Okay, so having said that, let's look at some examples since we have really very little time. I have something like 75 pages, I'm going to read them. But uh, <laughs> take a few minutes to read some Buddhist examples 
of how or the context in ancient India for the practice of sati or sati. This is very important because you'll see how different uh, it is from what she is describing, what they are describing, and that is this mindful observation, non judgmental, accepting whatever comes to mind, not judging, not choosing, not taking, which is very close to certain Zen teachings, by the way. But I find she had actually stayed in the Zen tradition. And as I said, that's the kind of thing that they can Shiva that it's a sadness or nervous. That's a very good thing. And I can, I have also Chinese examples, but I will not limit myself to the Indian examples. Um, just to give you a sense of how far away some of these things can be. So the first thing is, there is a very important concept that always accompanies the idea of meditation and the monastic life, because meditation in the old traditions was associated with the monastic life. In those days, in ancient India, there were no dharma centers where lay people came, right? There were monasteries. It went in a very different way. And those monasteries, part of cultivating attention and concentration, not just for people, attention and concentration, require that the person cultivate something called apramada. And apramada, which means something like not being distracted by excitement right? means that you make an effort to be physically and mentally careful about what you do, what you think, what you say. Right? So there is an external behavior that goes with it that is often defined by the monastic code. And this is part of what Shantideva is worried about in the book of is my behavior in accordance with the monastic code. So even in that particular chapter I'm talking about, which is the fifth chapter, he says, if I start moving my hands around, think carefully. And he says, hrudaya, me hrudaya. So something that is in German, the oze, my my heart, look, what are you doing? And then he says, stop them and be like a log. Why we used to do this is to physically manifest Abraham distraction. So notice how restricted is this notion of attention. It is attention, but it is very much restricted. And by the way, I'm not sure we we'll get to the point where we find examples uh, where we have a little bit more open view of where we are supposed to. But I'll start with the classic that some of you may know. It says, Renouncing violence for all living beings, harming none among them. By the way, if you as a psychotherapist were to tell your patient you must renounce violence towards all living beings, you probably would be acting unethically. Because you first have to know what the values of the patient are and you have to respect them. It's not a monastery, it's something different, right? But here you say, look, Stop being violent is all such beings, and then you would not wish for a son, S O N. How then would you seek a companion? So, this is a very ascetic message, right? Wander alone, not be my masters. And that line has been debated in the philological literature whether it means the rhinoceros or the horn of the rhinoceros, but knowledge of theology, so we won't go into that. I think it is about the source. Right? Yeah. The person seeking company will feel the attachment of love. And this follows from the previous line. Right? You, look, you see company, then you'll feel love. And this love is followed immediately by pain. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to a psychotherapist, but a good psychotherapist, one of the things he or she tries to promote is love. In fact, I have a hard time with the contemporary Buddhist use of the word detachment because human beings need attachment. I can't imagine anybody being practicing Buddhism and be happy with it if they have 